Welcome. I'm Amy McDonald, the director of City Space, and we are delighted to host a conversation with this rock star roster of the NPR women, Susan Stanberg, Linda Wertheimer, and our own Margaret Lowe, who got her start as an overnight production assistant on Morning Edition, and decades later became senior vice president for news, overseeing the work of 400 NPR journalists. She is now CEO of WBUR and our moderator this evening, here to discuss the very beginnings of NPR and the roles Susan and Linda, along with Nina Totenberg and the late Cokie Roberts played in its success. Lisa Napoli has documented, documented the story in her book, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Cokie, the extraordinary story of the founding mothers of NPR. And if you'd like to buy her book, our wonderful independent bookstore, Bookline Booksmith, is selling it. And just click on their link below our live stream. We'll be taking your questions throughout the hour. Just go to slido.com and type in hashtag tell me more. Margaret, take it away. Thank you, Amy. I've been so looking forward to this evening with Lisa, Linda, and Susan, and I'm delighted to have so many of you here with us in the audience, albeit virtually. As many of you probably know, NPR turned 50 this year, and when its flagship afternoon news magazine, All Things Considered, went on the air in May of 1971, it was little more than a scrappy startup, but it was also something different in kind. News and storytelling delivered with a very human voice, women's voices. I joined NPR 11 years after its founding in 1982, well after Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki had arrived. I was 23. Being an overnight production assistant meant that I got up at midnight, got to work at one in the morning on a bicycle when it was warm enough, and worked through the night with a small team of producers to get the show on the air before the sun came up, editing pieces of reel-to-reel -reel tape with grease pencils and razor braids. Of course, everything's digital now. And I have a distinct memory of Linda walking into our morning meetings with her signature red down jacket. Uh, I'm not sure if she had a red cowboy boots yet. Uh, and she would just come in and she would chat with us about what was unfolding on Capitol Hill. And she gave us this front row seat to that world. And at the time, it just didn't seem like any big deal. And then there was Susan Stamberg putting on her lipstick in the ladies room we all shared just before All Things Considered went on the air every night at five. It was this showtime ritual. And I think I was either too new or too shy to say much more than hello when I first bumped into her there. She was already a legend. But later on, um, during my days as a producer, I had the great fortune of working very closely with both Linda and Susan. And it was really, it was a chance to learn from the very best. And then decades later, when I was running the news division, it was a, a very different organization than the one I first walked into in the middle of the night. But there was a constant. And that was... Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki. And these four women may not have been the boss, but they were boss and stunning role models for a whole generation of women who followed them. Nina couldn't be here because she is still covering the Supreme Court with relentless energy. And this, of course, was an eventful day with the justices hearing arguments on the Texas abortion law. And I like to think that Koki is here with us in spirit, but I am overjoyed to have Lisa Napoli, Linda Wertheimer, and Susan Stamberg with us. So let's roll. Uh, we have lots of ground to cover. I'm going to kick us off, but we're going to leave lots of time for your questions, which you can enter, uh, enter uh, anytime, as Amy mentioned, at slido.com. Use the hashtag, tell me more. Lisa, um, I'm just going to start with you. You've written a lot of books, a book about Ted Turner and CNN, another about NPR benefactor Joan Kroc and her husband Ray Kroc, the man who made the McDonald's fortune. So what, what drew you to these women? What drew you to this story? Thank you for having me here in such august company and for asking that question. I love founding stories. I went to a little school called Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, which just turned 50 when um, it was only 10 years old. Uh, I love startups and probably because of that. And I covered the internet at the New York Times in its earliest days. And I worked at CNN in its earliest days. Like you going to NPR, I was going to that old country club in, in Atlanta 
when uh, right not long after CNN had launched in the 80s. So I just I love how things start. And I think it's really important, especially today, for us to step back into history and understand where iconic brands and people. I knew, of course, Susan and Linda's voices so well, but I didn't know anything about their backgrounds. So I think it's really important, like when you go to an art an art museum and you look at a work on the wall, I want to know the backstory. Um, and Susan Stamberg's not usually there to tell it to me. So I, I like to dig into it. And that's, that's what prompted it after, especially that CNN book of mine came out in 2020, because CNN just turned 40. It seemed like looking at NPR turning 50 was the natural next step. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you wrote this book and that you brought um, these wonderful women together. There's, an, there's this moment early on in your book that captures so much. You wrote, some women in the 70s marched for equality or sat on the sidelines, angrily lamenting the lack of it. Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki had, through a combination of will, timing, and talent, used their distinctive perches to elevate the status of their sex in a different way, working a hundred times harder than men while wielding microphones, as Susan described them as magic wands waving into the silence. Mm -hmm. Susan, um, I'd love to hear you talk about the power that magic wand gave you then and has given you for the decades that followed. Hello, everybody. Oh, I love this. Isn't this nice to think about and be quoted like that? Terrific. Um, it still is that for me, a magic wand. I have to say, it opens doors or it must be shaped like a key as well. But uh, I'm uh, sort of constitutionally uh, a schmoozer. And I like to, I stop strangers in the street to ask them questions or just talk to people in the elevator without proper uh, introductions. Uh, there was a, a high school classmate of mine who never wanted to come to my house for a sleepover, she said, because I kept her up all night asking questions. So I tend to do that wherever I am. And, uh, and that is the magic that, that, that the radio, that the, the, the microphone gets to pull in uh, with the most important people in the world, certainly presidents, uh, royalty, this and that, big stars, but also the people plain people like us, ordinary people who live and make dinner and, you know, take out the trash as well. And their voices, we are so lucky to be able to capture with those magic ones and to let the rest of the country hear them and hear one another. It just makes a kind of community that's really important. So that's more or less the answer to it. And there is something so powerful and intimate about the human voice um, that, that, that's unmatched by anything else. I think that's what we all believe in so deeply. Linda, did it feel like a magic wand to you, the power of holding that microphone in your hand? It was incredibly powerful and, and incredibly uh, <clears throat> wonderful to have that moment where you, you know, you could, you could go and see anybody. You could ask anybody anything. Uh, we were we, we never had to worry about whether we would be accepted or not. And if we weren't accepted, we were almost as proud of that as if we had been. It was, uh, I think it, I think we just, we had, we were given a lot of opportunities. Um, the, the ideas that we had about how the program should sound, um, what we should talk about, all those kinds of things. That was one of the most wonderful things for me about the, about what happened, which was that NPR was, it had a lot of young people and NPR did not, did not automatically assume that women were not the superstars in the, in the place. I mean, we could be, we were not, um, did, we, were, we were in no way diminished by our gender at NPR. And that was a huge thing. I mean, I'd worked at a number of places, the BBC, the BBC had an interesting, uh, they had a whole lot of, of very good women working there. And one of the reasons they did was because when the uh, war happened, the men all left and the women were left to run things. And not all of those men came back and none of those women gave up their jobs. So they had, you know, they had, they had sort of saved the day during the period of the Second World War. And they were an inspiration, I think, to me, 
to think that, you know, they didn't, they didn't know that they were going to run the place, but there wasn't anybody else to run the place, so they ran the place. And Nina tells stories about applying for newspaper jobs and being told we already have our woman. And yeah. so yeah, I, didn't. I don't have, I did not luckily knocking on plastic uh, have that experience ever. I uh, always got jobs uh, at the kindness of male bosses. Um, and I'm eternally grateful to them. Bill Seamering, who was the guy who hired me and who was the man who envisioned what all things considered would be and decided and the one who decided he hired Linda and I uh, decided I would be the voice of, of, uh, of all things considered. He said, come on in. And he said the same thing to Linda. Hers were a little more rigorous. Tell the story that I love that story that Lisa publishes about you and your interviews with Bill and his little early rest, red, reticence. <laughs> well, I came in to see Bill Seamering. I think I must have had, I had a, several interviews with him. But I came in to see him one day and I was just convinced he was going to give me a job, <laughs> but I couldn't seem to get to closure with this guy. So I, uh, I, I tried to figure out what on earth was, was wrong. You know, what, was the, what is the problem? And finally, I realized that he, he thought that I was a fancy sort of person. <laughs> I went to Wellesley. I was, uh, you know, I was, I was very well dressed. He was not to know that my mother made all my clothes. And uh, I, you know, I thought, I thought I was just a kind of regular, but then I realized he didn't think that. And that was standing in my way. So then I told him about how my father owned a neighborhood grocery store. And I remember I said to him, it's about, the, the store was not very big. It's sort of like this, this office of yours, maybe times four, something like that. And uh, I said, I, I delivered groceries. I got out in the pickup and, you know, and delivered groceries. And he said, you worked in your dad's grocery store? I said, yes, I did. He said, well, I, and I said, I went to Wellesley on a full ride. I had a big scholarship to go to Wellesley. I would not possibly have been able to do it otherwise. And he sort of sat back in his chair and kind of, looked at me and looked at me again. And, and I thought, I think I've saved the day. <laughs> I think <laughs> you said you're hired. he's going he's to hire me, and he did. Well, and not only were you not just a sort of an elite Wellesley girl, you were at Wellesley from Carlsbad, New Mexico, right? Yeah, that was that there was weren't, a There weren't that many people from Carlsbad <laughs> <laughs> in, in my class at Wellesley. No, there were not. <laughs> but there have been, there have been since then. You know, since they figured it, if I could do it, there must be some other ones around there who could do it too. <laughs> and just a quick side note on Linda, because I've been in the field with her and in many places across the country, she can two-step with the best of them. And that's not something you would know. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> one, of my, one of my, the favorite things we did. Remember, Margaret, we were, we were in Ada, Oklahoma, maybe? Yeah, was that it? Exactly, it was exactly where we were. And, uh, and uh, we went to it, some of my cousins, took us to a dance at the Grange Hall. And, and we, you know, two-step. <laughs> that was not something that I, you know, did a lot, but I did that It was that not night, big so. on the Washington scene. <laughs> no. <laughs> let me, let me, let me, uh, so at least one of the things that Lisa does in the book is that she, she beautifully weaves history into the story. And, and Lisa, oh. you might want to talk a little bit about how and why you did this, but you've given us this vivid picture of the times that, that these four women came to NPR it was the early seventies. The women's movement was unfolding the fight for equal rights. And, and I confess that the context helped me appreciate even more what trailblazers these women were. Um, Lisa, maybe you can talk a little bit about sort of how you chose to weave these um, this historical backdrop through, and then and and then I want to talk a little bit about the movement, women's movement, and sort of how it dro drove the two of you. 
Sure. I mean, I think it's so important when you look at a moment in time, whether it's personal family history or the creation of an important media network that no one was so sure was going to wind up being so important. It's looking at the moment in time that gave birth to it, uh, because that that influences the directions that it takes and the, the creation of public broadcasting just a few years before the actual launch of NPR in 1971 was such an interesting and fertile time, as is, of course, every single day in our universe. But that that moment in time gave birth to public broadcasting because people were worried about the menacing forces of commercial broadcasting. And that happened to be or not coincidentally, braiding together with the civil rights movement and equal rights for women. And so the fact that, you know, I, I'm in my 50s, I think that that Margaret and I are about the same generation, you know, one step behind Susan and Linda, we're, we're we, I, I didn't know all of that. I mean, I was just living it when I was going to high school in New York in the 70s and college then in the 80s and starting my working life and knowing the things that women bumped up against then. But to to step one step back and understand the context that allowed us to start our careers and that allowed us to hear Susan and Linda and to know that Susan and Linda just couldn't, it wasn't just that Susan and Linda were good at what they did and they got into a great place where they got good jobs and rose up. It was that they had to, um, that this, this was a moment in time, Susan didn't have to fight, but still it was, it was a moment in time that women didn't typically get behind the microphone. And knowing all of those component parts, I think makes, not just their accomplishments and yours too, Margaret, uh, formidable, it makes it more, um, you, it's rooted in place in a way that's, that's really rich and important for us to pass along to the next generations. Right. Very well, true. I'm, go ahead, Susan. Well, you, uh, the, the last thing you said, passing on, I mean, that was a, a role that all, all of us, Linda Kokimina and I did. Once, the minute we sat down at those more important desks, that is, we reached our hands out to other women and we mentored them and we said, come on in, apply for a job. There's a job that you might be very good for. We still do that. I do. Uh, when I, I run into people who really impress me, women who uh, and think ought to be part of this community. And I've done that all my working life there. And many of them have been hired and many of them have, been, have risen to, to very high positions. So that's really an important piece of it. It's not, and, and as far as I'm, and I'm sure this is as true for Linda and everybody else as it was for me, uh, you know, being the first woman, which I was, the first woman to anchor a nightly national news broadcast, all first people know, because there's tremendous pressure on this, that you have to be better than anybody. And you have to prove it, not just for yourself, but for the gender. And open, in almost every word you utter, open 27 doors to other women and make it public, show, prove that we're capable of doing it and we want to do it and we're loving doing it. And so there's that, there's that great joy in it, but there's also a certain amount of stress, obviously, and extremely, excruciatingly hard work. Did you, I mean, did, did you feel empowered by the women's movement? Did it, was, did it sort of filter in how you thought about yourself? I mean, how did it Im impact how you rolled? Linda? I, I must say that I was always sort of an independent thinker. And I had uh, a wonderful husband uh, who was so supportive of me. And maybe he was the first feminist I knew. He didn't lead the pack. He listened to me on occasion. <laughs> I had to introduce him to some of the principles. But nonetheless, um, it, I was tremendously influenced by uh, the books of the day, by Gloria Steinem and by uh, Betty Friedan. I read them uh, just ravenously and practically committed them to memory because I was reading on those pages my own life and my own reactions, which I thought were only mine and turned out to be so many people right. who shared those. So that was very empowering. Um, and, and also women's education, going to Barnard College, a, a women's uh, school, just like Linda's uh, Wellesley is and being told there what the expectations were of us as women and given the idea that there was nothing we could not do and we ought to try to do it all. So, you know, there was an accumulation of a lot of encouragement. And did, and Linda, you and the, and the women's movement, how did it fuel you? 
Well, I was I I was very uh, drawn to the leaders of the women's movement and paid a lot of attention to things they said and read everything I could find. And I thought they were I thought it was it was very impressive. I mean, I I continue to be very impressed by people like Gloria Steinem. Um, I think that uh, I think that one of the 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 differences for us was that uh, this had just, it had, it had not happened yet. It was in the process of happening. And it was such a wonderful thing to be part of. I remember thinking that there were, you know, thinking that my mother, who was uh, a creative, you know, interesting person, um, and also very, sort of very strong-willed person, remember thinking that my mother, if she had the opportunities that I have had, she would have been president of General Motors or something. <laughs> I had, uh, and, and I, I, th- I felt very lucky that we had happened to, happened to arrive at a moment where things were going on. And, you know, but you had to jump into it. You had to grab it with both mm. hands. You had to, you, ha- you couldn't let any tiny part of that moment get past you. And it was a little scary. It was a lot scary, in fact. And I, uh, I, but I loved it. I loved it. There's a, it. It actually it there. It actually takes me to a moment in Lisa's book um, when you, Linda, discover Pauline Frederick, who's the first woman ever to work full time for a television network. She was at ABC, I think. Um, and can can you? talk about seeing Frederick on TV and how that moment transformed your sense of what was possible for you? Well, I had always thought that I wanted to do something, something interesting, something that had to do with news. Now, in Carlsbad, New Mexico, we didn't have TV right away. In fact, we didn't have TV for a long time. We just had radio. So I was very interested in radio and very admiring of Edward Amaro, for example. And I really wanted, you know, I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll get the best education I can, and then I'll go and work for one of these wonderful men. I'll go and be, you know, I'll be a, uh, <laughs> a secretary or something, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be there. I'll stand by and keep them, I work very hard to keep them as smart and wonderful as they are. And, uh, and then... I was sitting in the in the sort of the sunroom of our house in Carlsbad. My mother was standing at the ironing board, and I saw this woman coming out on the steps of the United Nations to talk about the invasion uh, of Hungary. And I said to my mother, "That is a woman." <laughs> and my mother said, "Very good, Linda. Very good." <laughs> I mean, I, and I really had not, I had, it, it had never occurred to me that there were women doing that work mm. and I had never seen one. And there she was. Mm. She was so kind too. She, you know, I mean, I, I sort of threw myself at her feet the first time I met her and she, you know, if you, if you find, if you see a picture of Pauline um, in some, you know, some book about women and television and whatnot, you'll see that she's wearing a little heart-shaped pin. She gave that to me. She, uh, she was just very kind. She, she reached out to us and she helped us out. And she was, I think she was very, she was kind of stunned that we thought she was important. <laughs> that's, a lo- that's a lovely story. You know, um, it's interesting actually. Um, you know, representation really does matter. You, seeing someone who looks like you doing this really important thing allows you to imagine just as you did is in, in your Carlsbad kitchen, hey, hey, maybe I can do that too. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and now we're thinking so deeply about that when it comes to issues of race. Yes, and sure. and yeah. you two blew open the new doors for young women like me who followed mm-hmm. in your footsteps. Can you, I'd love the three of you to l- relate that to what's unfolding today when it comes to issues of race and equity and inclusion. Hmm. Well, one of the things that you always have to keep in mind is Nancy Pelosi is the most powerful woman in America. And Nancy Pelosi has been, as we've all seen, remarkably skilled and able to handle 
that amazing position that she's in. Uh, she and the women who, you know, the women that she has served with in the House and Senate, she was, she is such a hero, I think, um, to me, to all sorts of women. Uh, she was a very close friend of Cokie Roberts' mother, Lindy Boggs, and, of, and also a close friend of Cokie's. And I think that, I think that, uh, you know, you see these amazing women and you just can't, I can't, uh, I can't get over how she has managed to, uh, you know, to, to deal with so many very complicated things. I think if we didn't have, uh, if we didn't have her, I don't think that, uh, that, Senator, that President Biden would be doing as well as he has done. I think she's, you know, she's standing right at his elbow often. Mm -hmm. And I think she is one of the people that's sort of guiding and steering him. And I think, I think he's very lucky in that, in that mm -hmm. respect. Um, you know, we've all, we all admire uh, first ladies and Jill Biden is a very nice example of a first lady, I think, but uh, she's, you know, she is the wife of, she's mm -hmm. not running it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think it's, it's very <laughs> exciting to see somebody who's got the whole thing in her hands. And many times we thought we think she's going to just completely drop it. And she hasn't yet. Mm -hmm. You were asking about race, though, really, weren't you? I, I was. And in then before it's a representation, yes. But there again, it's, uh, it's uh, sort of a similar answer. And it, uh, to me, it has so much to do with numbers that uh, uh, the country is ready, one hopes, to revisit racial issues. All races need to do that. All of us need to do that. But what, what you see is a density of well-educated, middle-class working people of color who can be tapped now and are being in extraordinary ways through media. I mean, you can't open a magazine uh, without seeing page after page of utterly gorgeous uh, uh, African Americans and some some Asians as well, although they're under such pressure now and and, and cruel pressure uh, because of the virus and blah blah. blah. But anyway, um, so so the climate. I feel this is tec tectonic change that we're living through this minute. It's not ahead of us. It's not uh, we shall overcome someday. It's overcoming and it's happening right now and it's really paying off, you're seeing evidence of it. And I do not imagine there'll ever be steps backwards on this. It'll be tough, it always is, but, but still the progress, it's really thrilling to watch this progress and shocking, you know, it takes your breath away. Suddenly you realize, oh, this is what it's like. This is what it's like to be uh, part of a minority that's coming to power, that's coming into their own now at this moment. That's really exciting. To experience frightening, threatening, all of those things. But it's happening. It's another moment. Lisa, did you want to add anything? I'm in again looking at the lives of, <clears throat> excuse me, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki. I was reminded of the DEI struggles that that are being waged today, or you know, the the, the attempts by people like you, Margaret, to to make sure that there's better representation. Right now I'm working on a book about Marian Anderson in 1939. Uh, oh. And uh, I'm just reminded that we've had these conversations for decades. They look different. They, 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 they manifest themselves slightly differently, but we have been, as Susan says, working incrementally. And that Pauline Frederick example uh, with Linda was such an, a, a, a huge, huge one. Uh, I would like to just shout out really quickly. It's too bad that Pauline Frederick was uh, forced to retire at age 65, 64, um, because ageism is another issue that mm -hmm. I think we'll start confronting now, um, hopefully in the next years too. She came, as you get older, yeah, she came to NPR, you know, and she was doing a, a regular, it was a weekly discussion program for a, a number of years, I yes. think, there, as did Daniel Shore, as did a lot of people who weren't finding work anymore that they wanted to do, maybe in vi bigger venues or work, work places that didn't want them anymore for those age issues. But then NPR saw excellence and always wanted that and, get, and opened doors for it. 
I, I have so many questions to ask you, and it turns out that our audience does too. Good. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to an audience question or two. Um, and I realize that not everybody knows this story, and it's something that Lisa writes about in the book. But how did you all meet? What happened? Did you just start working there at the same time? I know that it was a sort of cascading a cascading succession from. Uh, Susan and Linda to, to Nina and Koki, but I'd love you to just share that story. We, uh, we did come at a relatively close rate in time, but uh, you and I, I guess did. we really got to know one another when we shared an office. We were office um, Yep. Yeah. And uh, we shared, it was Susan and me and the Xerox. <laughs> It and was I, kind of, I made a sign. Do you remember my sign? And <laughs> then pasted it on the door, a côté de Xerox. And I put it outside and we shut that door because we didn't want anyone. People are coming in to make copies of things. How dare they? We were thinking. <laughs> but anyway, but it was, not, it was not so bad because we, we got to meet everybody. We probably knew more people <laughs> by <true>. name <laughs> than, uh, than most people at NPR did because we saw them all. <laughs> But it was, you know, they were not, there was, there was nothing elegant about NPR's early days. Uh, the very early days, we didn't even have furniture. Uh, we had our very first staff meeting, and Susan wasn't there yet, but our very first staff meeting, we were sitting on the floor. Mm -hmm. And I was still looking around thinking, this is not looking good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's going to make it, but it made it. Um, but then, uh, uh, then along came, who came next? Then it was Nina. Nina's next in 74, 75. Yeah. And then Koki. And then but, Koki in 78. Of all, of all of them, Nina was the one I know least to this day because she was never around. Well, and yet, luckily I know knew you because we were office mates before you and Koki took off to the Congress. And I, I, I never got a, the anchor. And then we vanished from view. He's very and then we isolated, covered. stays in a studio all day working and doing a thousand interviews. So it was different, but we could, we could tell, we could gossip when we saw one another and catch each other up, but it was on the fly. One of the things that was fabulous about working at NPR in the early days was that uh, we had, we, we, we women had some of the most responsible jobs in the place. I mean, I was, I was covering Congress and I wasn't, I, I wasn't allowed to, I mean, I wasn't covering the Senate or the House. I was all over the place. Um, I, and then covering presidential elections. Koki and I had a, you know, a kind of a, a duet going with the presidential elections. I would go out on the plane with the candidate and Koki would follow the campaign driving um, and she would talk to voters and I would, you know, I would sort of keep up with what the guys were planning and what they were talking about and what they thought was important. And then Koki would talk to regular folks about what they thought was important. And it was a, it was, it was, I think it was a very good combination of things to be doing. And I think, we, I think we did a, we did a hell of a job on that. I wish, I wish very much that, uh, you know, that that kind of coverage of, of campaigns was still going on. Mm -hmm. Those were some of the, you know, best and worst days covering mm -hmm. campaigns. Mm -hmm. You know that Iowa, mm -hmm. Iowa now has a uh, commercial that says, come and visit Iowa. I don't know if you see that where you are, but come and visit Iowa. How wonderful is Iowa, beautiful Iowa. And I, my, first, my first impressions of Iowa, well, my impressions of Iowa for years, was it was the frozen wasteland where I nearly died at the beginning <laughs> of the campaign from the Iowa caucuses. Right, in the middle right. of winter, in the middle of winter. Here's another audience question that I'm sure you get asked often and I, I'm, it might be hard for you to come up with an answer, but um, what are the most memorable or your favorite uh, interviews oh, or stories yeah. you ever did? And, favorite, and favorite interviews or favorite? Or stories story. Interviews, I can't tell you because I must have done 50,000 of them by now in my life. So, you know, the, the cliche no answer kidding. is... It could easily be that many. No, it's not serious. But uh, the cliche is, 
my favorite interview will be the next one that I do. That's a safe answer. And with any luck, it could happen. I just had a couple of wonderful ones yesterday. Um, stories, oh, that's just so hard. I like during Watergate, uh, mm -hmm. how I, I had lived in India. My husband and I, my husband was in a kind of foreign service, a foreign aid agency. And uh, we lived there for about three years and then came back home. And shortly after that, I, I went to NPR. So I still very much in my mind had the picture of Indians gathering around the wells in the center of their villages and the women gossiping and trading news and information of the day. And so I wanted to create that on the air and thought about it a lot. How do we, and we, I called it the village well. How do we pick up what's on people's minds? Uh, and and uh, I got groups of people throughout Watergate who I uh, went back to regularly every week, taking their pulse orally. How are you reacting to this? How are you reacting to that? And when the, the very pro-Nixon Republican said, I'm really having second thoughts about this, we knew that the, that the whole thing was turning and that he'd lost public support. And we were about to see a new chapter in, in the history of America as we, as we did. So I, I love that story. It just kept going and going. Wonderful. Susan did, a, Susan did it with a, a series of individuals that she returned to. I did the same kind of thing with, a, with groups of people. Yeah. I always picked groups of people who knew each other so that they wouldn't have to spend a lot of time measuring one another. Uh, and it was, it was, you know, I think we made a big effort to let people be the voice of polls. And we had a great deal of help from, uh, from the, the, Pew, the Pew Center for the People and the Press who had some really one, did some really wonderful polling. And Andy Kohut used to come and, and you know, help us, guide us, sort of steer us in the direction of here are the things that, that we, we need to find out how people feel. And uh, it, it, it was a very interesting, a uh, fascinating time to be go, you know, to be doing asking those kinds of questions. And also, you know, as Susan said, we we could ask those questions. We could right. just go anywhere, talk to anybody, and ask those questions. I could ask Dave Brubeck if he'd mind coming to play the piano in my house because NPR didn't have one. <laughs> and he said, sure. And he did. <laughs> and he sat down. There's the piano. I haven't dusted it since then. It's been 40 years. And he just plays the piano for me. It's incredible. And I had my magic wand out, of course. Incredible. Oh, Lisa, right. you looked like you wanted to say something. Yeah, you know, just hearing hearing both uh, Linda and Susan talk, I think it's really important to remind the audience. I can't see them, so I don't know how old everybody is out there. But it's really important to remember that what they were doing in the 70s and then what you joined to help do in the 80s was before this media ecosystem that was always on. I always like to say, you know, now this is a TV channel right here in my hand. Um, international broadcasting is possible from this phone, but in the 70s and 80s, uh, especially when Linda and K uh, Koki were running around, when, when uh, Susan was interviewing President Carter live on the radio, that was happening before C-SPAN, before cable news. And so not only was their power amplified literally and magnified literally, um, there, there were so few outlets for people and that, that, made, that is what made the power so amplified and made the responsibility so amplified yes. too yes. and um you know it's it's strange to think about the ecosystem that we're in today uh where anybody can broadcast anything at any moment in time because they couldn't then and that that just came with enormous power both both not for for they themselves as broadcasters but the lawmakers knew um, newsmakers knew that there were very few places where they could get their stories out mm -hmm. or want to shield their stories from being told. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that pre C-SPAN, pre all cable news, pre, pre, pre digital uh, internet era, everything was completely different. And again, that's the braiding of the stories with the women's movement and the changing media landscape. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, um, there's a there's a 
there was a power that NPR had early on, um, but there was also a relationship that it built and has built, I think, over decades with its audiences. And people feel um, a profound connection to the place. Like there's, it's like, it's, it, we've often talked about head and heart and the relationship that they have. And in part, it was, it was what Susan and Linda and Nina and Koki created. But I think it also has to do with the culture they created. And Lisa, um, you've covered CNN, you've spent a lot of time in other kinds of newsrooms. You know, the three of us in some ways have spent, devoted most of our life to this great calling. Um, did you, as you explored NPR and, and, and the story of the founding mothers, did you, did it strike you as a place that was different in kind somehow, some way than anything else you'd seen before? Yes, and it really did have to do with the fact that women, these women were empowered from the very, very beginning. And they felt this sense of responsibility, as I was saying, not just to each other and to the network, but to the voice that they were being allowed to express for the first time. And I think that's why I'll let them speak for it. You all reached out to one another in DC, um, in the media world, because there were fewer women in that world, but they were starting to make headway. And that idea helped um, fuel the place. And of course it sets the tone, just way it sets the tone. If you feed a baby good food from the beginning, um, it goes, it, it continues on well, hopefully after that. I have no idea what it's like now, but that from then it just definitely, certainly different than the, the craziness of CNN's landscape in its early days. <laughs> and, and, and Linda and Susan, do you feel like that sort of that, that culture that, you know, the culture that you created is still sort of coursing through the place? Does it feel like it's somehow in the soil and endured the values, the yeah, I'm absolutely amazed by that. I think it is, uh, I think back to what Bill Simmering in his, in his founding document <laughs> talk, describing what he wanted all things considered to be like and what he wanted to do with what he hoped that NPR would be able to do, the extent to which that is still true. And, we're, and NPR is still trying to do it and still quoted by the new ones who come in and the very young ones in their early 20s. And they, they can quote parts of it in sections and, and sentences from it still to this day, they study it and they look at it. So it's upheld, it's different though. It's so much bigger than it was when you were even their market. Um, and and the, it, there's a range of ages. There's certainly much, much more diversity in the staff than, than there ever has been. But, um, and then there's this push about news and push about breaking news and push about staying on 27 hours a day and getting it all out. Right. And that really just changes, changes the climate. So, but, but the basics, the basics are, is still there. It's true. You know, uh, another member of the audience asked a question that feels related. With your firsthand experiences at the founding, do you think the network and public media have lived up to the hopeful aspirations? It's sort of a continuation of the question I asked. Oh, sure. Exceeded them, actually. It exceeded them. Uh, but, but the strange thing that has also, also happened, and really the lamentable thing, uh, is the demise of newspapers and, and the demise, really, of news uh, on any other medium. I mean, tele television news has so disintegrated into opinionation. You know, you don't go there for uh, objective information anymore because they're not interested in doing it. Apparently, the ratings aren't that high for it. Uh, and the papers, which used to be your daily source. I mean, we began every day with handfuls of clippings, you remember, of stories we th thought we needed to do. We'd bring them in to uh, the editorial meetings. And we said, well, the Times did this, what about it? Because we had no resources. We had a handful of uh, uh, reporters in the early days. Um, but those two things have put much more pressure, I think, on NPR and, and given a greater sense of responsibility. Uh, for carrying on the delivering of news because there are no other places to get it anymore. And that's been uh, a big shift, I think, in the climate, as well as in the way it's looked at in the way the, the suits, you know, the managers uh, look at us and, and, uh, and, uh, and require uh, 
an approach that was nothing like what we founded, that we founders had. On the other hand, we were very ambitious from the beginning. We just had nothing to be ambitious with, you know. Mm -hmm. Now we've got some of that, although always fundraising. But nonetheless, it's it's just a different feeling. The suits probably aren't wearing a lot of suits these days. I guess that's what sweatshirts. <laughs> There's, you know, there are many unexpected good benefits to this dreadful pandemic. One of them is right. You can get rid of the suits, and the men don't have to wear ties. <laughs> well. Go ahead, Linda. I was going to say, I think that while we've been while we've been sort of following Lisa around and talking about the book, um, I don't suppose that most of the people who see us on Zoom uh, have ever seen the sweatpants that everybody wears <laughs> that we're all wearing right now. <laughs> I mean, I, I would I would not dream of standing up. <laughs> Mine actually says 50th anniversary NPR. Somebody gave me this. Oh, all things considered. Yes, yes. On your sweatpants? Yes. Oh, we have yes. to see those. Oh, please. <laughs> this is just too embarrassing. And it means I have to hold my stomach in. Wait, can you see wow. That? There you go. I don't <laughs> believe I'm doing this. I'm a woman of great distinction and stature. <laughs> We need to get them in every color. <laughs> That's wonderful. I, I do think it's true what you described, Susan, which is that the, the role and the responsibility of public media and public radio is profound now because I actually often say that it's really one of the last great, hope, great hopes of, of journalism and especially local journalism because it simply disappeared from the landscape. Yes. Um, we think about that all the time at WBUR. Sure. I want to, I want to, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that I, uh, one of the things we have not talked about um, yet is politics, which is what I spent most of my career at NPR doing. And I was going to say that one of the things that I always, it was always sort of marked my thinking about politics was that I remember very well all of the terrible mistakes, the times that somebody, something went horribly wrong. <laughs> we, had, <laughs> we had many wonderful and exciting and incre incredible times, but I must say that there's something, something, I don't know, kind of heart, some, some little twisted thing in my mind that, uh, some of the things I remember best were the worst things. <laughs> because you learn lessons. You learn the best lessons from them. I mean, your own mistakes. And you have to think about them because you feel so bad. Is that what oh, you're yeah. saying? Horrible. Yeah. Um, I, um, I want to take, take you, um, Linda, to a, a different dimension of this conversation, which is sort of, really thinking about the personal relationship that the four of you built. And if I'm, and I, and Lisa writes about this, Linda, you and Koki and Nina um, had dinner together with your husbands every Saturday night for decades at a little hole in the wall Italian restaurant in Bethesda, Maryland, um, just outside Washington mm -hmm. called the Pines of Rums. And if I'm not mistaken, it opened its doors right about the same time you arrived in town. And it was, mm -hmm. and I think still is this red checker tablecloth, red sauce kind of place. And Lisa writes about that in her book. And, and you talk, um, all of you talk about how the founding mothers um, backed each other up, helped each other endure the most anguishing times. Linda, I'd love you to just describe for us what those dinners were like and how they evolved over the years. Well, we just had one last weekend, last with us on Saturday, we had dinner with Steve Roberts and of course, Koki wasn't there. And we're all still, you know, even though so much time, as much time has passed as has passed, we still are, you know, we're looking at that empty chair. We just can't stop doing it. But it was, um, we, we had, we were traveling a lot. We were covering, you know, all kinds of campaigns who we were in and out. 
So whenever we were in town, whenever we were all in town, we would go together to a restaurant, to this restaurant on a Saturday night and just sit there and talk and talk about all of the things that had happened, we'll tell the stories that we hadn't been able to tell on the radio for one reason or another. Um, having, having each other was just enormous. Uh, Koki and I were basically, we, we had the same job. We did things, uh, we, we covered the Congress when there was no election and we covered the election when there was an election year. And uh, it, was, it was the most wonderful kind of thing because I, I'm not sure that men have the same experience that women do in a situation like this. There wasn't, we were not competitive. We were not trying to do each other in. In fact, we did a lot, of, we helped each other a lot, uh, you know, passing information on, uh, helping, helping when one, when one of us was, I remember we used to, we used to occasionally get into a, uh, Nina would be trying to break a story and she, there was something she couldn't find. And Koki and I would be calling everyone we could think of, seeing if we could fill that gap in her story. Um, but that was, that was something that I think women bring to uh, this kind of thing, this kind of job. And, and I'm not sure that men do. Even though, you know, women have uh, such a terrible time trying to hold their own against uh, the, uh, an industry where most of the, uh, most people working on the air, there still are a tremendous number of men and not as many women. Although you do see now on television, places like MSNBC, so many women, it's just stunning mm. to me. Mm. But I, but we, we were, we did this in the kind of, we were doing it together. I think that we all felt very strongly that we were doing it together and that if anybody needed help, there would be help. But it ex extended with that, these three. I had a, a young child that, so it took a lot of my attention and uh, couldn't be part of this group. But after my husband died, they took me in. They said, come on, we're going to movies. We're going to the Pines of Rome. Oh, really? Couldn't we go to a better place? No, this is the place that we have gone all these years and we're not changing. But they did that and they do that still. And that's, uh, you know, that's something women do too. The I, remember, anyway. I remember actually being quite envious of that tradition. It just seems so embedded in your lives and so marvelous. Um, yeah. Susan. Yeah. You just turned 83, which oh, is... Oh, yes, I did, didn't I? <laughs> um, Listen, I just want to say, first of all, let's pause while everyone gasps. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, but second, I also firmly believe that women should tell their ages. We need to tell our ages all the time, always. Well, so I am proudly gasping. 20... I am proudly 20 years your junior oh, and, my. If I, and, and I, um, you are an inspiration. Um, I, I, I mean, what's sort of astonishing and you, you got at this a little bit, I mean, Lisa was hinting at this too, right? Which is that, um, that there's also the issue of age in these jobs and, yes. and Susan, you're still reporting, you're finding people and stories that capture your attention and it, in this incredibly fast-changing media world, which is obsessed with youth, um, what you're doing is almost unheard of. And you, um, to me and so many others, you're an inspiration. And I'd love to know, I mean, you, you know, you just said you just did a great interview yesterday. I did. What, what, what still excites you about the work? Oh, uh, again, it's the magic wand and the doors that it opens. I will never tire of that. Uh, and, and the asking of questions. Stop me if I've repeated, the, repeated this already because I am 83, but I had a friend, <laughs> did I tell you this about my friend in high school who didn't want to come to sleepovers because, oh, I did that already, did I? Because <laughs> I kept her up all night asking questions. Well, I do it in the real world now all the time too. And that's what excites me is the chance to learn something new. And also I do a lot of things that are really important, impossible to do uh, on the radio. I do the visual art. Mm -hmm. And so when I see a painting or a creation, a work of art uh, that I find wonderful, that is thrilling. It does for me what art does. I mean, it lifts you out of yourself and it takes you into another world. It calms you down. 
It gives you some focus, clears the mind, lets you go out and talk to the next stranger, the next stranger, and learn something about it. I love it. It, it's wonderful. Um, Lisa, I wonder what writing this book, sort of getting to know these four women changed you or, or informed how you thought about your own life as a journalist. Wow. Yeah. Well, it changed me to know the backstories of these women whose voices I've heard for years and um, the institution. It, it changed me to know that the institution had scrappy roots. i should have known that it did. I've you know, worked, as I said, I love startups. I love startup stories, but knowing the specifics was really, was really useful. You know, it, it changed me as a journalist in the sense that I wish I'd been born earlier. I coming into it in the eighties, I'm 50. I just turned 58 yesterday. Um, coming say. into it in the eighties made me, you know, made me enter the system at a different time. If you've read the Katie Couric memoir, that was the world I entered where it was uh -huh. a little bit more cutthroat and yes. a different universe. So um, it just made me wish, wish, of course, I know no time is better or worse. Every time is, is fraught. Mm -hmm. um, but it just, it made me appreciate it. Uh, the, the, the time that I have been working in a different way than I had before. That's why I love history. I should have been a history teacher. So now at this you age, are. I'm becoming one. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> There's still time. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna close with a question to both um, to both Susan and Linda. It's funny. I mean, I describe you two and and Koki and Nina as role models, but the truth is, I actually wasn't conscious of it at the time. I just knew I was in a place where it didn't feel like there was anything in my way, and that if I worked really hard and got good at what I did, I would be okay. Um, I, I just want to ask you a really simple question, which is something that we all do in our lives. You've done it your whole careers. Um, Lisa, surely you have too. Um, what advice would you give to somebody just beginning now, just stepping into journalism, male, female, anything? What's the best advice you have? Susan, let me start with you. Okay. Uh, I would say follow your instincts and have confidence in them. Don't, don't uh, turn, turn your internal editor off for a while and just be open to new possibilities, which is asking the impolite question, say, or, or following, uh, following some impulse that you have that doesn't, because something doesn't feel right to you and keep at it and pressing it, but also go in as, as prepared as you possibly can be know what it is you're asking and know maybe what the answer might just be so that you hear the contradictions and you hear people backing away from it. I, I, that's sort of, sort of more the practice, how to practice journalism. I guess it's more about that. But so much is what's inside you, that is the curiosity and, and the lust to know more, to learn things, and more than that, be able to share them. That's it. You've got to, that audience has to be there. It, broadcasters, it's not an accidental word. We want to cast broadly the things that we learn. And I, we do it in behalf of the democracy. I think that's a high goal and lofty. And one that you've lived up to for decades. Linda, do you want to? I think that uh, I think that it's very important to be constantly curious, trying to figure out what, why things happen the way they do, asking all the questions that you can think of to ask. But I would say mainly Never, ever uh, try to, never, never be a, you don't want to be a coward about it. You want to just throw yourself in. You want to get your feet wet. You want to get hammered every once in a while. You want to know <laughs> everything that can happen. Uh, you, it's, it's, you, there's no other way to really get all the information that you, that you need. You have to have the courage to just throw yourself in. And I would say, you know, I, I, never, I never said no to, a, to an assignment. And people would say, we need you to go to blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, not a chance. I am <laughs> not going. <laughs> and then I'd say, sure, when? <laughs> you know, because you can't not take that step. You have to take that step. 
And I think that, that, that that's what journalism wants people who will do that, who will step out in front of a, you know, a crowd and ask the questions that need to be asked, or will sit down with a, with a mean, vicious politician who will say dreadful things to them and then, you know, make sense of it. It's just so important not to chicken out. You just gotta, gotta keep going. Margaret, you know, someone had asked me during one of these talks where Susan and Linda weren't there. They've been so generous in helping me promote this book. But an, a gentleman asked me, what do I do with my granddaughters to make them like Susan and Linda? And I said, you know, what did you learn from their stories? And I said, from looking at all four stories, even though each woman is so from a totally different background, the unifying principles were just what Linda said, don't take no for an answer, even if you don't, you want to take no for an answer, just keep plunging through tenacity and also a loving family environment. I mean, each family completely different, but nobody, I don't think, told any one of you, you can't do it. No, no one in your household, maybe the, the guy at CBS told you, you can't do it. But <laughs> The idea, and or maybe your parents thought you were a little bit off to to want you know, in Nina's case to want to do it, mm -hmm. but you did it, and and you knew that that was that your support systems, husbands and families mm -hmm. were there to bolster you, and you know yes. you can't manufacture that of course, but we can choose. We can't choose our families, but we can choose the people we surround ourselves with, and and to fortify ourselves. Um, so that that was really instructive for me. To, yeah, to learn great. that about you, and it's yeah. a it's a it's a wonderful uh, note to close on. Lisa Napoli, author of the book Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, the extraordinary and it is indeed extraordinary story of the founding mothers of NPR. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Susan Stamberg and Linda Wertheimer. It's so good to see you too, and thank you to our wonderful audience for being with us tonight. Um, Thanks for having us. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Happy Thank holiday you. season. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to everyone. <laughs> Happy turkey. <laughs>